Battle Shonen series are everywhere, and have been around since before most of us were even born. At the core of what makes them work is a method of fighting. From basic martial arts to the wackiest abilities the human mind can conceive. But what makes a power interesting, and what goes into designing a good power for the characters in these stories? Today I want to delve into that, from their varying complexity to how they differ based on the role of the characters that possess them. But before getting into the video, be sure to like and subscribe if you want more content like this, and it really does help if you hit the bell icon and comment your thoughts. And if you really want to support the channel, head on over to my Patreon in the description below. It all helps out. Anyway, back to the video. When looking at any ability in terms of its construction, the most important metric to look at is how much it lets the character do. Really, every ability can be put on a scale going from the most basic to the most all-encompassing. At the far left, you have your basic energy blasts, your super punches, anything that just does damage. On the far right, you have pretty much omnipotence, characters that are just straight up god with a capital G. It's a scale that charts abilities from being able to do one thing to being able to do literally anything. Every power in fiction exists somewhere on it. And when you look at abilities from this perspective, it reveals something kind of interesting. Within the middle of this graph is a sweet spot where you have the perfect balance of versatility and limitation. One example I want to focus on is one of the most iconic powers in anime, the Gomu Gomu no Mi from One Piece. Luffy's ability to stretch his body is far from original, but the gum gum fruit is an ability that Oda has done literally everything he can with. For anyone that doesn't read or watch One Piece, Luffy has a technique called Gear Second, where he uses the elasticity of his body to increase the speed at which his blood pumps, improving his physical abilities. And that's only one of several other techniques. Using just the power of rubber, Oda has created an ability that enhances physical stats, increases attack range, allows him to rebound attacks, lets him fly, and grants him different forms. The Gomu Gomu no Mi is a power that allows him to handle a variety of situations, but he still has to be inventive within very strict limits. Another ability in this little Goldilocks zone is a more recent one, the Ten Shadows technique from Jujutsu Kaisen. For anyone that hasn't seen it, Megumi has an ability that allows him to summon 10 different familiars from his shadow and use them to fight for him. Compared to Luffy, there is much more variety here, from a lightning bird to an elephant that shoots water to a bunch of frogs. However, the reason it works is because all of the familiars, except for one but that's manga only, is inherently very limited. Nue can fly and shock you, Max Elephant is a tank and and shoots water. The frogs can bind people. His divine dog is good for close combat. None of them do anything too crazy, they just all have their own strengths and he has to choose depending on the situation. Now so far all I've done is really explain these powers. That doesn't say why they're interesting. So let's look at it this way. Imagine Luffy is about to start fighting some strong opponent. At this point in time, we have a very good understanding of his power and how he likes to use it. We have in mind that there are a variety of ways he can approach a fight, and if he goes into gear 4th, there's an inherent intrigue on which one he'll choose. Maybe he'll focus on overall stats and his ability to fly, or maybe he'll stay back and try to overwhelm his enemy with speed. And then there's the secret other option of Luffy using his Devil Fruit in a way we simply didn't think of before. Remember all the way back in Eni's lobby when Luffy used Gear 2nd for the first time? By all means, that was an ass pull. It had no buildup, no foreshadowing. But it doesn't feel that way. At least for a massive majority, no one really seems to mind. And that's because of the inherent nature of the ability. 
The technique has a solid explanation for how it works, and it all exists within the confines of an established power. The same kind of thing goes for Megumi and the Ten Shadows technique. He has literally ten different ways he can approach every fight. More than that, since he can combine his Shikigami into new forms to gain new advantages. How he approaches a fight is always something worth thinking about before the fight starts. You get to speculate, and then there's the satisfaction of seeing the decisions he makes. To sum it up, an ability is most interesting for fights when it has a balance of variety and limitation, because it encourages a viewer to think about how it will be used and allows a writer to add new ways for it to be used without it feeling contrived. And there are a lot of examples of this kind of power in popular franchises. In the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure anime, you have abilities like Josuke's Shining Diamond or Buchirati's Sticky Fingers. In Naruto, you have Shikamaru's Shadow Possession Jutsu. In My Hero Academia, you have Deku's Black Whip and Bakugo's Explosion. And there are a ton more that I can think fit this. In fact, I'd love to hear what you guys think fits this kind of mold in the comments. However, at the end of the day, this is just a mold. Not every ability needs to be this way. In fact, with all of the characters and abilities I described so far, you might notice a trend among them. They all belong to characters that are a part of the main cast, or at least have significance for multiple parts of the story as someone on the side of the protagonist. That's because this middle section is perfect for characters on the protagonist's side that will be there for a lot of the story. Going back to Luffy, you kind of need him to have a power with variety because he is going to have the most fights. If you don't give him an interesting power, his fights will get stale really quickly. You do not need to give these powers to characters that will be there for a single arc. In fact, you shouldn't as it would be a complete waste. However, there's the other side to this balance. Oda gave Luffy an inherently limited ability because otherwise he would simply mow down his opponents. You would usually not give that kind of power to a main villain because it is generally their job to be imposing. Overall, the main point is that most main cast members with interesting powers will have an ability that is in or around that middle ground because it suits their narrative role the best. However, that isn't always the way to do that. For example, the main examples I gave are from One Piece and Jujutsu Kaisen. In One Piece, most of the time you can only have one Devil Fruit, and in Jujutsu Kaisen you can usually only have one Curse Technique. So the writers of those series need to make that one ability interesting if that's their goal. But let's look at someone like Naruto. The chakra system is much less limited in that capacity as a person can learn multiple jutsu. So while the Shadow Clone Jutsu and the Rasengan, his two signature moves, are much more on the simple side of things, together they make for a rather interesting fighting style, especially since the Rasengan has multiple variants suited for different situations by the end of the series. And that isn't mentioning any of the other stuff he can do. In a story where characters can stack abilities on top of each other, creating interesting combinations is another way of making for a dynamic fighting style. But again, this is only talking about main cast characters. What about other narrative roles? One similarity I noticed was how both characters in the mentor role and the main villain role both tend to have abilities on the right side of the spectrum. This makes sense because while they are usually on opposing sides, they are also both indicative of being higher up on the story's power scale. At the beginning of a story, the mentor is generally someone who shows extreme competence in the worlds they inhabit, and most of the time their powers reflect that. Kakashi has the Sharingan, Gojo has the Infinity Technique, Yami has Arcane Stage Darkness Magic, stuff like that. Antagonists, as I already said, need to be a reasonable threat, so their abilities have to be something that's threatening. Although this is only most of the time, there are occasions where it's the exact opposite. Sometimes the writer isn't trying to make a neat concept for an ability and instead wants them to be the embodiment of brute force. All Might is a great example of this in the mentor role as that is what better suits his story. 
Uvogin from Hunter x Hunter, a story renowned for its interesting and diverse powers, is just a brawler. And that works for his character. It really depends on what the writer wants to do with the character. This all being said, while I've gone over a lot of examples, I haven't actually gone into how to write an interesting power. Knowing the workings and getting the method are two different things. This brings me to the facet that underlines all abilities in fiction. This brings me to the core concept. If you look at all of the abilities I've mentioned so far, they all have an underlying core concept. The Gomu Gomu's core concept is stretchiness, or rubber. Bakugo's explosions is explosions. You get the point. And noticing this brought an interesting trend to my attention. Generally, the more abstract the core concept, the further right on the scale it is. Like when you compare All Might's One for All and Gojo's Infinity, the concept of strength is inherently much more limiting than the core concept of Infinity. That's because Infinity is much more abstract as a concept. And it's a consistent thing, just look at prominent villains in Shonen. Aizen manipulates perception, every other JoJo's villain manipulates time. All for One and Krolo literally interact with the power system they're a part of, and Pain's Renegon is based on the samsaric realms of reincarnation. You get the point. Abstract concepts lead to more varied abilities, leading to more opportunities to make them extremely powerful. So when coming up with the powers of a character, figuring out what their narrative role and their core concept is would be the vital first steps. Where on the scale do you want them to be and what kind of impact do they have on the story? A lot of it is really just figuring out what it is you want to do with a character instead of following some hard rule. And that means there is quite a bit to think about for it. But I hope this video provided some insight on the kind of thought that goes into this and the kinds of abilities that suit which kinds of characters. It's complicated, but that kind of thought has made some of our favorite abilities in fiction. Anyway, that's the video. If you liked it, do be sure to show it in any way you can. Thanks for watching and have a good one.